Welcome back guys. This video is about the nth term test for divergence. First I'm going to state the theorem which is known as the nth term test for divergence. And we're going to talk about its contrapositive and we're going to talk about its converse and then we're going to look at some examples. So here's a statement of the theorem. It says if the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth term of a series is not equal to zero, then the corresponding series must diverge. And I think that makes intuitive sense. Um, because if I'm adding something to itself infinitely many times and those things are not approaching zero, um, there's no way that I can get these can be a finite sum. So let's say we took the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n and we got two. Well then I've got these numbers on a list and after a long time all of them are getting closer and closer to two. Then what would happen over here is I'm adding all those numbers together so you get something that's close to 2 plus something that's close to 2 plus something that's close to 2 infinitely many times. And maybe they're not close to 2 at the beginning, but eventually I get a bunch of numbers that are close to 2 and I'm adding them together. So it actually makes sense to me that this would diverge. Um, we call this the nth term test for divergence because it only tells us one thing. It tells us when a series diverges. It does not tell us anything about convergence. So let's look at a particular example. Let's say we have the sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of n squared. Now if I write this out just to get a sense of what's going on, um, I'll get when n equals 1 I'll get 1 squared, when n equals 2 I'll get 2 squared, when n equals 3 I'll get 3 squared, when n equals 4 I'll get 4 squared, eventually I'll have some nth term. And remember we're adding all of these up. So I've got 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared, 4 squared, eventually n squared, and we're summing them. So add this, and add this, and add this. And there are some terms in between, and we add that. And there are more terms at the end. It keeps going forever. Well, let's look at these numbers. That's 1 plus 4 plus 9 plus 16. All the way up to n squared. Just intuitively, if these numbers keep getting larger and larger, is there any way that I'm going to add up all of these and get something other than infinity? Um, I hope you see that the answer is no. Um, this is going to have to be infinity because you know each of the partial sums is approaching infinity. The sum as I or the sum of the first n terms, s sub n, that's one plus four plus nine, all the way up to n squared. If I take the limit of that as n goes to infinity, as n goes to infinity, n squared goes to infinity, and so we get infinity. So this series diverges to infinity. By definition, it diverges to infinity because we're looking at the nth partial sum. Or we might say this series increases without bound. It's another way to say it. Okay, so that's one approach of showing that this series diverges. Well, I could also use the nth term test for divergence. The nth term test for divergence just says, take a look at your a sub n, which is this n squared right here. It's not the nth partial sum, but it's the nth term on your list. Here's your a sub n. And take its limit. The limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n is the limit as n goes to infinity of n squared. And of course, if n is a large number, n squared is a large number, so we get infinity, 
Since that limit is not zero, according to the nth term test for divergence, we're guaranteed that our series diverges. So I'll say that's not zero, which implies that this series diverges by the nth term test for divergence. So this over here on the right is how I would apply the nth term test. But this is how I reason through it. This is how I justify it, how I justify the nth term test. If I have something, if n squared is going to infinity, and I take the sum of all these terms, of course, if this is going to infinity, the sum of all the terms before it and that one is going to go to infinity. It makes perfect sense. Um, if these are getting larger and larger and I add them together, I'm going to get infinity. Um, so if this goes to infinity, that means the sum goes to infinity. Or by the nth term test, we could just look at the nth term and say, since n squared goes to infinity, um, this series has to go to infinity as well. So let's just apply the nth term test instead of talking through this piece. Um, although we will talk through the piece um, to justify our answers with each example. So let's say we've got the sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of, let's say, sine of uh, pi n over 2n plus 1. Well, you might say to yourself, why would I use the nth term test for this? Well, you know, as n goes to infinity, I think we're going to get something other than 0 here. And remember what the nth term test says. If the limit of the nth term is not 0, we're guaranteed that the series diverges. So here is my nth term. And let's just compute its limit as n goes to infinity. So I have the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n which is the limit as n goes to infinity of the sine of pi n over 2n plus 1. And the limit of this sine function is the sine of the limit of the inside. That was a theorem about continuous functions that we studied back in Calculus 1. If you have a limit of the outside, and this function is continuous at the limit of the inside, so you can plug in that point, then you just pull the limit inside. It's totally legal. Um, as n goes to infinity, this goes to infinity and this goes to infinity. It's an infinity over infinity in determinate form. Now you could switch to x's and use L'Hopital's rule, um, but since it's polynomials, we've got a linear polynomial in n and a linear polynomial in n here, I will tend to divide by the highest power of n in the denominator. Since I've got a 2n plus 1 here, I'm going to divide everything by n to the first and divide everything by n to the first up there and everything will be equal. So we've got the sign of the limit as n goes to infinity of this, the n's reduced so we just get a pi in the numerator and the denominator 2n over n is just 2 because the n's cancel plus we've got a 1 over n. Do I have an infinity over infinity in determinate form anymore? I hope you said the answer is no, um, and you'd be right. Because that's a pi, and as n goes to infinity, 1 over n goes to 0. So we just end up with the sine of pi over 2 Remember from trig, sine of pi over 2, that's right there. That's 1. So we've got that. Now you might be saying, well, that approach is 1. That doesn't tell me anything. Well, be careful. The sequence a sub n approaches 1. So as n goes to infinity, this guy and the next one and the next one, if I just write these in a list, the list is approaching 1, then we're going to add them all together. Since this limit is not equal to 0, the series diverges by the nth term test. And again, the idea is eventually I'm going to add this number that's very close to 1 to itself infinitely many times. And even if it was just 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, if I do that forever, I'm going to get infinity.
So, um, yeah, let's expand this just to see what's going on. When n equals 1, we've got sine of pi times 1, that's pi, over 2 times 1 plus 1, so that's 3. Plus, that's the n equals 1 term, the n equals 2 term, so we're just increasing that index by 1. When you plug in n equals 2, you get sine of 2 pi, all divided by 2 times 2 plus 1, that's 5. Plus, when n equals 3, you get sine of 3 pi over 6 plus 1 is 7. And you're going to keep going. Let's see, when n equals 100, what do you get? We get sine of 100 pi over 200 plus 1, so 201, and you keep going. And you see what happens. This quantity inside, you get pi over 3, and 2 fifths of pi, and 3 sevenths of pi, and then 100 over 201 of pi. That ratio inside is approaching 1 half of pi. Just, as like, we, just like we see here, when we take the limit, we get a 1 half of pi. That's what this expression is approaching. So this is approaching sine of 1 half of pi, or sine of pi over 2, which is 1. And then I'm going to have a bunch of those added together, infinitely many of those, forever. And if I add a bunch of 1's to each other, I'm going to get infinity. Um, since these all happen to be positive, the, this series not only diverges, but it diverges to infinity. Um, or you could just say, the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n, that's 1. That's not 0. Therefore, the series diverges by the nth term test. But the reason why this 1 is a problem is because eventually I'm adding something to itself infinitely many times and it's not 0. Um, if I'm adding a 1 to itself infinitely many times, I'm going to get infinity. Okay. Um, so that was a good candidate for the nth term test. Um, here's another good candidate for the nth term test. So I've got 3 to the 1 over n. Well, that's my nth term. That's my a sub n. If I expand this, when n equals 1, I get 3 to the first. When n equals 2, I get square root of 3, 3 to the 1 half. When n equals 3, I get the cube root of 3, 3 to the 1 third. When n equals 100, I get 3 to the 1 one hundredth. And we keep going forever. Well, if I want to determine whether this sequence or this series converges or not, I'll take, I'll take the limit of a sub n as n goes to infinity. This is an exponential function. Exponentials are continuous, so you can bring the limit inside. And as n goes to infinity, this guy goes to 0. So we end up with 3 to the 0, which is 1. Again, I'm adding something that's very close to a 1 to itself infinitely many times. So the series diverges. Since the limit of a sub n is 1, and that's not 0, the series diverges by the nth term test. Now, a couple of other things that you should be aware of. Here's the nth term test. It says, if the limit of the nth term is not equal to 0, then the series diverges. In logic, there's something called the contrapositive. The contrapositive of a statement um, is like the statement in reverse. It's the statement um, backwards with a negation. Um, so we need to talk about what this statement is. This is saying, if this is true, then this is true. Um, the two statements that we're relating are often called, referred to as P and Q. 
This is saying if P is true, then Q is true. So we're saying P implies Q. So if this limit is not equal to zero, then we're guaranteed that the series diverges. So this is our P and this is our Q. It's P. Now the contrapositive of that comes from doing Q first and then negating it. So that's saying not Q implies not P. And that's a little strange. Another way to interpret this is to say, if Q isn't true, then P isn't true. If something is true, its contrapositive is always true as well. So here's the contrapositive of this. If Q isn't true, so Q is the series diverges. The, the converse, or um, the negation of that is if the series doesn't diverge, it converges. So if the series converges, that's our not Q. Then the opposite of this is true. Well, this is saying the nth term doesn't approach zero. So not P would be the nth term does approach zero. I know this is a little bit confusing. Now let's just focus on the statements themselves. This says, if the nth term doesn't give you zero, if the limit of the nth term is not zero, then the series diverges. And the reasoning that we used to justify this, um, it was a little bit hand wavy. It was just us um, talking intuitively about what was going on. And we said, yeah, that makes sense. Um, because if I'm adding, if I get something that's not zero here, if I get some, something like three, if I add that three to itself infinitely many times, I should get infinity. So it makes sense that if this isn't zero, this would diverge. This says, take the, if, if this isn't true, then this isn't true. Or in other words, if the series converges, then it has to be the case that the limit of the nth term is zero. And that's saying, if we can add all of those numbers together, infinitely many of those numbers, and we get a number out, and it makes sense, so we add these together and we get 20, just for example, then it has to be the case that all of those pieces that we're adding together get smaller and smaller. Remember when we were looking at the geometric series and even that intuitive example with one half to the n for the series? The reason why we could add up all of those pieces was because they were so small that they sort of fit together. And whenever you add them all up, they were the, the sum approached a finite number. Um, this is what's required for that sum to approach a finite number. So if the series converges, the a sub n must be getting smaller and smaller so that when you add them up, um, the sum is finite. So this says, if the series converges, you're guaranteed that the limit of a sub n is zero. Okay, so that's true. Now here's something called the converse. The converse is just, if this says P implies Q, converse is Q implies P. Um, This is a true statement. This is the tr a true statement. But this converse is not necessarily true. If this is true, its converse is not necessarily true. So the converse is this. If the series diverges, then the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n is not equal to zero. That's not true. Not true in general. So let's add some qualifiers to the nth term test for divergence. Um, given that the converse is not true. So the nth term test says if the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n is not equal to zero, 
um, then the series diverges. We should also say that if the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n equals zero, that tells us nothing. The series may or may not converge. So far we've looked at geometric series and we can determine whether those converge by looking at the R value. We've looked at telescoping series. We can find out whether those converge by looking at the limit of the partial sums. Here we're saying, okay, um, if you can take the limit as a sub n goes, or as n goes to infinity of the nth term and you get something that's not zero, you're guaranteed it diverges. This is the nth term test for divergence. And we call it the test for divergence because it only tells us whether something diverges. This part, limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n equals zero, it tells us nothing. If you get a zero here, the series may or may not converge. This is when the nth term test is inconclusive. It gives you no new information and you have to try another test. So you might see if it's geometric. If it's geometric, use that test. You might see if it's telescoping. If it's telescoping, use that test. Um, if it's neither telescoping nor geometric, you might use some of the um, tests that we're gonna learn later in this section. Um, so this is our nth term test. Keep this in mind. If a sub n, if the limit of a sub n, the nth term, is not equal to zero, the series diverges. If the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n is equal to zero, the series may or may not converge. Now remember, a sub n is the nth term. It's not the nth partial sum. It's not s sub n. Um, so the nth term is a sub n. That's the nth number on your list. The nth partial sum is the sum of the first n terms. So that's a sub 1 plus a sub 2 plus a sub 3 all the way through a sub n. That's different. The nth partial sum and the nth term are two different things. So keep that in mind when you're working these problems. Okay, so I want to show you just a couple of series where the tenth, nth term test is inconclusive. Here's one. We're going to prove it in the next section. This is called the harmonic series. When n equals 1, we get 1. When n equals 2, we get 1 half. When n equals 3, we get 1 third. When n equals 4, we get 1 fourth. The nth term is 1 over n. This is called the harmonic series. Notice that the limit of the nth term is zero because as n goes to infinity, one over something really large is something really small. But it turns out, as we're gonna see in the next section, the series diverges. So the nth term was zero and here's a case when the series diverges. This one's very closely related to the last one. When n is one, I get one. When n is two, I get one over two squared, so that's four. When n is three, I get one over three squared, so that's nine. When n is four, I get one over four squared, so that's one sixteenth. And we keep going. For this one, it turns out that the limit of the nth term is zero. Because as n goes to infinity, one over n squared goes to zero. And it so happens that this series converges. So something happened. Something happened in between this exponent of one and this exponent of two. Somehow these guys were getting smaller. 
but they weren't getting smaller fast enough. When I add them, as n goes to infinity, when I add those partial sums, somehow the partial sums still go to infinity. Over here, each of the individual terms is, there should be dots at the end because this goes on forever, and there should be an n squared there, excuse me. Um, each of the individual terms goes to zero, one over n squared goes to zero, and when I add them, they're getting small enough, fast enough, that the partial sums are approaching a number. Here the partial sums are approaching infinity. Here the partial sums are approaching a number. So this one converges, this one diverges, even though the limit of both of these guys is zero. So here's your takeaway. If the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n equals zero, the test is inconclusive. The series may converge or it may not converge. Now if you get lucky, you see one and you say, hey, I think that nth term approaches something that's not zero. It's a, maybe it's a sequence that you recognize and you're like, oh, I know how that pattern works. I, I think I'm, I'm pretty sure that that limit's going to be one half. Go ahead and compute the limit, show that it's not zero. If the limit is not zero, you automatically get that the series diverges. That's why we call this the nth term test for divergence.